Good evening, Madam Chair. My name is Stacy Smith. I am the um, president for Local 2882. I was elected several months ago. Um, this is my first time speaking. Um, but our, our union represents approximately 280 members. Of those members, we are all frontline workers. We are eligibility technicians. We are um, customer service um, aides. We are um, interpreters, other clerical staff, including child support agents. Um, we are the people who make the eligibility determinations for all programs such as Medicaid, SNAP, cash assistance, child care benefits, and child support services throughout the state. I was hired almost six years ago. Um, I took the civil service exam in order to ob obtain my job. And I'm pretty much here asking for your help. Um, Governor McKee's administration and Director Brito's leadership has opened the doors for us to have more communication. Um, and your ability of requiring um, documentation for hiring reports has helped greatly, but we're still short-staffed. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, in January, we had, there were 659 filled FTEs, but we have approximately 100 positions still that we need. Every day we come in and we work hard but the number of cases that we're seeing, we don't have enough staff to keep up with them. We're on time frames that, are, that don't even make sense anymore. We're being timed on how long to work a case, depending on which, what kind of a case it is. We often don't know what those cases look like when we, when we pull it from our system. So it becomes daunt, a daunting task. Um, Bridges doesn't often work the program's been here for almost seven years, and it doesn't often work. It doesn't work better than it did in 2016, 2017. Yes, but do we still have problems every day? Absolutely. The case num the cases are just crushing. Um, 35 minutes to do a new application, and that is if we have everything. Most times, we're not following policy. We're not following it. We kind of skirted around it because of COVID when the doors closed and we had to close our doors and think of how we were going to do the work in a different way. And, and so policy wasn't something that we were following strictly because there were so many waivers in place. And now that those waivers are starting to end, we need to get back to following our policy because unfortunately, the customers that we serve the people in the public, they're used to the policies that we've had for the last three years, and so they're not following them either. So we're not getting documentation that we need on a daily basis for those cases, and it takes, it just extends how long we have to work that case. Um, in our call center, and when I first started with the department, I started in the call center. So I know what those call lines look like. Sometimes customers are on hold for hours, and when you get that call, the first thing they're doing is they're yelling because they're upset. They're waiting, they're, they're desperate for our help, and they're frustrated. So if you're on a 20 minute time span to be able to answer those questions and get through their case and see what's going on, it's hard when the first 10 minutes you've been yelled at and still being professional. Um, determining our eligibility is it's very technical. I think that for us to not have our civil service exam is would be a problem. Would be a problem. Excuse me. I said before, it's sometimes it's hard to get the information that we need from our customers. So when on when we receive an application, if we have everything we need, we could probably poss possibly process that case that day. But often we're missing employment information. We're, we're missing who, who is in their household, what their expenses are. Every single program has a different policy. So we have to integrate if they have, if they have more than one program that they're applying for. We have to look at the policy for each of those programs and be able to enter that information into the system to be able to determine what they would be eligible for. We have to know the federal rules, regulations, and all of those policies. It's a lot of pressure. 
and we've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of my coworkers, they left. They've left for other departments, they've left state service altogether. And um, in the call center, I have members that call, as the president, I have members that call me, they text me, they email me, and they tell me what's going on. All across the state, we have many offices. All of the offices, um, all of our front end, front line offices, Providence, Warwick, Woonsocket, Wakefield, Middletown, all of those offices see customers daily. We have back, back offices where I work in Cranston. Um, there's two offices there that we do back end work where we don't physically see the customers, but we're doing the work behind the scenes. And, and it's just, it's, it's like an avalanche. It's, it's never ending. Let's see. Dur due to the COVID, um, the COVID pandemic um, health emergency ending, we're gonna have so many applications that are coming through, recertifications coming through from medical. And I know that the department is wanting to have a contractor that comes in and helps us assist with that work. I, I have concerns with that because as a state employee, we have to, we have to be able to um, go through that case and, and finalize and authorize that case. A contract employer cannot do so. So my fear is, are we gonna be duplicating that work? Because we have to go through the case to make sure that it's done correctly. Over 300 recipients are going to have to, they're gonna to have to be redetermined. And I know that it's being broken down over a course of a year, but when you have other programs that we, we work with daily, such as SNAP and childcare, and those, those programs are all intertwined, it's, da it's daunting work. We've only added three net positions in the last few months. Um, we, we started, we have a new office, we have many new um, ETs that started over the course of the end of summer into the late fall. And, and when I saw the numbers that when they were broken down, I realized that because we've lost so many members that the members that we've recruited and that we have that are doing great work, we, don't, we still don't have enough, we're still behind the eight ball. And, and if we don't do something now, we're never gonna get, we're never gonna get from under it. We're never. We've been asking for months on end. Sometimes I feel like we as ETs, we're standing there and we're, and we're just watching what's coming. We all know April 1st is coming. We all know that these recertifications are going to start and we're looking and, and asking and begging for management to be able to give us the staff that we need to be able to do that work. And it looks as though we're going to be hit with the tsunami and none of us have life preservers. None of us are ready to be able to combat what's coming for us in less than three weeks. Um, even with a contract um, staff, they still have to be hired. They still have to be trained. They still have to have all of these steps done and we're already going to be starting this work in, in, on April 1st. So we're behind. And we, have, we, have, we don't have enough staff to do it. I want to um, assure that the uh, committee that we do want to be part of the solution. Um, again, Director Brito has been very open in having open lines of communication, trying to be transparent, but sometimes that gets muddied as we go through the process. And so, we as a union have agreed to lateral freezes. So our e eligibility technician ones have a six month lateral freeze to help with onboarding of new staff. We did that last year and we were able to get the members, um, 40 members, but then with all the staff that left, we really didn't net, we didn't net anyone. We are working with um, um, an agreement to decrease the amount of time an eligibility technician one can work before they can transition to an eligibility technician two. So what that means is eligibility technician ones are back office workers. We work in the background, we work cases that we don't need to physically see the customer, but in all our forward facing offices, those are the eligibility technicians too. They are the, they are the people that meet the customer, sit with the customer, go through their case. And with a new office opening, in, in July, potentially, we're gonna need to be able to staff that properly. Um, when we left Elmwood Avenue um, 
and we moved to, we ended up moving to eventually um, one Reservoir Avenue. The staff that we had at Elmwood Avenue is not the same front end staff that we have at one res. That office is not able to see the influx of people that are coming in. And I know that it's been said that notices have gone out to um, the customers and that um, they're getting letters and they're having social media information given to them. But often either they don't understand it, um, they maybe they're not able to read it, but they're going to come into the offices. They're going to continue to call. And if we don't have the staff that can handle that, that then we're going to be we're going to have we're going to have a lot of problems. Um, my members, they're they're tired of excuses. We I, they come to our meetings, and they hear this, and they're like, "But what are we doing? We've been asking for 18 months for more staff, and it's not here. And now we have to start this work, and we're short staffed." Um, so I, I do appreciate your time, um, and I, I, I can answer any questions that you may have to the best of my ability. I think we have some questions. <coughs> Thank you. Representative Alzate was going to go first, Grace. Oh, oh she is. Uh, is it Jim? Sorry. Jim? Jim. Jim. Yes. We going to be real good friends. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm always an optimist about having good friends. Um, I don't fully disagree with you about the civil service exam. Mm -hmm. I do, I, but I also don't agree with you either, <laughs> right? So we're going to have to meet in the middle at some point. Um, I, think, I think these exams, like lots of exams that we're talking about, both in, in the education field and other, other careers and things like that, it, it is a barrier. And what we heard yesterday is that it is a barrier to hiring. And to um, Stephanie, is it Stephanie? Stacy. Stacy, girl, I'm gonna get you a lifeboat because come come April first, you guys are gonna be drowning. And I, I, I hear you. I I'm sorry for what's what's coming. I this has been an ongoing issue. I feel like we have this conversation yearly. It's it's not enough. Whatever whatever you guys are doing. It is not enough. You do need the help. We hear you. We, I, I, like I've said all night, like I've, I've worked with the clients, right? And so I know what your offices are like. I, I'm trying. <laughs> well, I will say this, that um, in regards to the civil service exam, we have a list of candidates mm -hmm. on that exam. And, and the Department of Administration and HR are stalling, for lack of a better word, with how quickly they can process those people mm -hmm. that are on that list. They'll call lit names and they'll call candidates and then they offer them positions and then they're giving them a window of up to six weeks to accept a position. Mm -hmm. And that's too long. Yeah, We're, we're being told that um, oftentimes people rescind that position right before they're about to start. And so my argument to that is, why are we waiting six weeks then? Because if someone is going to rescind that position, if we gave them a window of two weeks, then at least we're four weeks ahead instead mm -hmm. of six weeks out if they rescind on that sixth week. Yeah. 